Well, we're going to finish the Sermon on the Mount today. Uh, please turn with me to Matthew uh, chapter, uh, chapter 7. Uh, we're going to be at 12 because I was supposed to teach 12 last time, but I was running out of time. But we're going to finish out the chapter. That's fantastic, special today anyway. I'll give you a moment to turn there. <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, and I pray that your Holy Spirit power, Lord, would fall upon our hearts, Father, and that you would indwell me, Lord, and that in this very moment, Lord, you would give me the words that I am to speak right now, for, Father. I pray that you would pierce our hearts, Lord, and correct us, Lord, and I pray that you would guide us and direct us, Lord. Lord, help us not to be given to our own selves, Lord, but to be given over to you completely, Father, and to hear these words in seriousness and soberness, Father, because that is how they are written, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, help us. Please help us, Lord, to walk your way and according to your statutes. In the name of Jesus Christ, and in no other I pray, amen. I remember reading a great preacher one time, and this preacher said that he knew a great preacher who sometimes when he felt like in his call he was getting off track, which sometimes can happen to ministers. The, the cares of the world can come in and start to choke out things on them, and they have to keep their minds very right. And there are certain passages in the scriptures that cannot be approached honestly in the emotional content of the way they are written and with the content intellectually that is there unless you have your mind right. And what this minister used to do whenever he would feel like he was getting off of where he needed to be in his head, this may sound kind of uh, uh, dreary or something, but he would go and visit a cemetery. And he'd walk around and he would, he would reflect upon the duty that he has for people. And that as he felt like he has go, gone forth on a Saturday to look at this as though he were work, looking over the precipice of eternity, then he would have his mind right for Sunday morning. Because really what is going on in church is that we are preparing for eternity and we can never lose that in our heart. And this must be a driving force in you. And you must meditate upon this, that your days will not always be around. That there must be something in you that drives you, an engine inside of you, which is the Holy Spirit driving you to what is right and to labor with all your heart to love the Lord Jesus Christ with everything. Do not hold back and do not imitate other people in the way that they approach it. You must come according to the scriptures in no other way. That is way, why this man would go forth and do this. And every time I think about that, it chokes me up because I think about the times when I have felt like I'm off. But there are times in this nation as well when we need to look over the precipice and ask ourselves, where are we going with what we are doing? And that's just a simple thing. And that's the gospel. It is to save you. It is to save you. It is good news from the doom that the wrath of God is coming. And nowadays we don't like to talk about wrath anymore. And it's disappearing from the pulpits. But it is a reality that we must face. The wrath of God is real because we have a just God. And no matter how you argue it one way or the other, at the end of the day, you must face that you will face God. And that's what we have to do. And one of the ways that we know how we will face God is how we face our brethren. And that's why in 12 it says, Therefore in everything, treat other people the way that you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophet. It's interesting, historically, this was stated many times before the time of Christ, but it was never stated in this positive way. Normally it was in the negative. Don't do these things to people if you don't want them to be done to you. But Jesus Christ is one of the first times in history we see that someone flips it around and says, no, it's not enough to not do evil to people. What you must do to people is enact with love towards them actively, creatively, imaginatively. See, lots of us think that because we haven't killed someone, we must be good. Or because I haven't swindled someone, I must be good. But we've never thought, maybe I should be pursuing the health of another individual. That I would promote their health. Not just not kill them. Or another individual that I should pursue, that they should be flourishing in their life. Not just not swindle them. So he meant that it should be active. And this is a force that can only go, if, you know, the average kind of secular morality is not to do evil. But the morality that comes from Jesus Christ that is only empowered by the Holy Spirit and by those who have faith in God and have Him dwelling within them is that they know and they understand that there is something in them that is impelling them. It's driving them. It's forcing them towards that they should actively, not just in some kind of milieu in their head, say that they love people, but that they must bear fruit. And that's what He's talking about. 
Some people have tried to compare this to Buddha, that he has said similar things, or different Greek prophets or anything like this. But Jesus puts it on a whole new level. As we go on through here, he starts to talk about that you must be a doer. You must be a doer. There is no other way. You cannot just say that I was saved or I, I felt like I came forward when I was 14 years old or something like that and that I'm relying upon some kind of memory of the past and I look at that memory and I go, that is my proof that I am saved. That means nothing. You must look upon yourself right now and say, do I have faith in Jesus Christ right now in the present? If you have faith in Him and trust in Him and love your fellow man and love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength right now, that is the proof, not something in the past. And don't you rely upon that because often we want to rely on this thing and that thing and that thing so that we can avoid every single thing that God has actually dictated by which you should understand where you stand with him. That he who thinks he, stand, and he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. The idea there is that you must be thinking. You need to be someone who's reflective upon yourself. Uh, so let's go forward with this. It says, enter through the narrow gate. The entering through the narrow gate is not disconnected from how you treat other people, is it? This is how you enter through the narrow gate. But here it starts to describe, first we understand, need to understand how many gates are there. Well, he says there are two. And you have to understand there's no third way. There's only one way that is right. And there's a way that's wrong. And so it says the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter into it. Many. Do you catch that? In this day and age, and I fear sometimes our democratic way of mind has convinced us somehow that somehow we can determine what is the right way to go by seeing which way the masses really are flooding. And Jesus Christ says, no, what is right is not determined by democratic order. It's not determined that way. That's just something that we rely on sometimes whenever society has abandoned what the true way is and we are grabbing around and we've abandoned the word of God and we say, well, I don't know about that and I don't know, that doesn't sound so good and stuff. And so we're just floating in midair and we start to just try to find a way. And what we won't admit is that really we just start looking to the people around us. And I start saying, well, some people are, a lot of them are starting to go this direction. They're starting to say a lot of this thing. And it's what I call trending morality. It's where it's just like the internet. It's like you got to get up in the morning to find out what kind of morality is trending on the internet. And that, oh, okay, that's the type of opinion I'm, so, I'm supposed to have now. That is going to drive you straight into destruction. It says that that way is to destruction. And that should be the thing that sticks in your mind, that word. Just let that sit there, destruction. Destruction. That is the motivation in your heart. Some people say, well, you don't want to teach any fear to people. You don't want people to get saved because uh, they're afraid of hell. What kind of intellectually responsible person could ever hear about hell and not say that fear should be involved somehow? I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to hell. Is that a bad motivation? I mean, if we just take it intellectually, is that a bad motivation? I think that's a fantastic motivation. There are some people who study their way to God. They find out that the proofs of Jesus' resurrection and all this stuff is true and it inspires their heart and they realize through these different fancy arguments that God is real and they realize that this is all true. And so they have come through their intellectual means. And there's others who have come through the means of they realize that their sins are dragging them down to hell and they can feel that it's destroying them. And there's other people who can see the glory of Christ easily and they just fall in love with it. I don't care how you come, but you need to come to Jesus Christ. You must deal with all these different things because there are different people with different types of problems. But you need to find out what is in between you and those gates and you need to remove whatever the obstacle is. And so in this day and age, we're not supposed to do anything but tell you it's just so good to live every day as a Christian and that's the only means by which you should understand coming to Christ. That's simply not true. Right here he says there should be a motivation in your heart why do you avoid which way the crowd is going? Why do you avoid that? Why do you want to look at this and you see this massive gate? And I, I remember one day I was driving out to Shawnee and I looked and I saw, man, there's all this construction. What in the world is that in Shawnee? They're making this road wider and wider and wider and wider. And all of a sudden I drive by, what is it, Fire Lake Casino? I go, oh, okay. I mean, gee whiz, the name. Come on, let's just reverse the words. It's crazy. How things can be so in front of us and 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 we're seeing there's nothing out there but you know what that roads getting wider and it's getting wider and it's wider 
But you know what? Just because something is big and in display and it seems like the wisdom of all these people have chimed into it and there's some kind of systematic connection where we're supposed to flock around like geese and go the right direction, somehow through the group, the thing that should be in the back of your mind when you look at the crowd is the word destruction. Destruction. And you never take that out of your mind, ever. Let that be a motivating force in you. Uh, you're told not to do that, but you know what? Do that. But have, and what we have here is something else. When you look at it, the gate by which you enter through is always a gate that is very broad. And it's a physical description that is saying that, you know, when you go through a door that's very broad, it's not hard to get through, is it? You can carry luggage with you. You can carry baggage with you. You can carry all your desires. The idea here is that the physical description here of this ease of fitting in means that you can go in in any form that you so desire that there's nothing that needs to be dropped. There's nothing that needs to be shedded. And that's not the way it really is. And that's why the other gate is described a very different way. The other gate is described as small. The gate is small. You catch that? You know who can fit through a small gate? The other day I found out the, the hard way. Out of my family, who, who do you think fit through this crack in the gate? It wasn't Daddy. It was Gabriel. And it, it comes back to me. Who did Jesus say we need to become like to enter into the kingdom of heaven? You know what? You've got to be small. You've got to be small in yourself. You remember when the prophet said to, San, uh, to Saul, he said, you know what? You were doing really good. I'm paraphrasing. You were doing really good when you were small in your own eyes. But when you became a big guy, you know what? That's where the problem came in. And you thought that you could defy the things of God. But I noticed that my son could fit through there very easily. He's a very simple individual. I know a lot more than him. I've been to school, all these different fancy things, but I can't get through that gate. You need to become small in your own eyes. You need to have faith like a child. And you need to get rid of all these different things. You can't just come into the way of life carrying everything you have. You must get rid of it. You must get rid of certain desires. You must get rid of certain propensities that are in your heart. You can't just carry them with you forever. And as you go through that gate, it says that the way itself, once you get past the gate, you enter in that way. Then the way that you go is narrow in itself. And so the entire process, and this is the description of your life, once you enter in through Christ, is that the proof that you did go through the right gate is that you are still on that same path. If the path that you were on is broad, yet you claim that the gate that you went through to get on that path <clears throat> is the narrow gate, you're insane. You're on the wrong path. Because the path that is broad describes the type of gate that you came through. You came through the gate to destruction. And you're just on your way. But if the path that you are on is the narrow gate, which means that you are to come through Christ alone and you live by virtue of His commands, and you live by virtue of coming to Him and discipling yourself underneath Him and shedding away all that sin that besets you and the burden of weight that's pressing down on you, dragging you down to hell, and you begin to shed these things from you because the glory of Christ gives you the freedom from sin. And He starts to tear these things from you and you start to walk and the path that you see yourself walking on is narrow. And it has been narrow for quite a way. And you know, it might be getting more narrow all the time. By the fact that you're on a path that is narrow, it tells you what gate you came through. You need to judge yourself at this moment. When a preacher has told you, look, look at your path. If your path is the broad way that everyone's going on towards destruction, if it looks like those who are going towards destruction, you never went through the right gate. You never went through it. You never did come through Christ. But you tell yourself that you have. You may look like the wheat, but you're chaff. You look very similar. And maybe we can't tell it, and it's hard for us in our little stupid human minds. We can't always find out who's who and what's what. And sometimes by the end, we don't know. But God will never be fooled. You can't play a game with God. Anyway, but he turns to something else that's related to this. So that's the way of life, and that's what you remember. The motivation for this type of gate and this type of path that you're on, that carrot that dangles in front of you, what is it? The same thing that you need to run from is destruction. That stays in your mind. 
But to make it vivid for you, you run from destruction and you run towards this thing that is life, life, eternal life. Anyone ever read Pilgrim's Progress in here? Pilgrim's Progress is a great Christian fiction. And it talks about this man is hearing all these different voices telling him, well, you need to do this. You need to do that. No, no. You need to not stop going. You need to not go to church so much. And you're becoming a fanatic. And all, the, and all these voices are speaking to him from family members and friends. And finally, he does this. He covers his ears and he begins to run. And he says, life, life, eternal life, life, eternal life. His focus was singular. And that's how your focus must be. But people tell you you don't need to be that way. You don't want to be a fanatic. You don't want to love Jesus too much. You don't want to seek holiness too much. You can listen to their voice and follow them to destruction. Or you can listen to Jesus Christ who says, enter at the small gate and go on that narrow path. And you will end up at life. And I guarantee you, your first 10 minutes when you enter into heaven, you'll go, worth it. Totally worth it. I guarantee you, your first 10 minutes in hell, not worth it. Not worth it. It's vivid, light and dark. We must teach the wrath. We must teach the grace. And that hits you in a vivid manner. It shocks you and wakes you and it penetrates you. I remember hearing a preacher preach one time and it was so true and so pure that it felt like I almost imagined a cannonball going right through my chest and making a hole. It needs to be vivid and it needs to be clear because you know what? On one level, you know if you're hearing the truth, right? You do know that you're hearing the truth sometimes, and sometimes you know you're just hearing something that you like. And you need to not always be about your preference, but you need to be, uh, be about God's preference. And that's why he gives you a warning about who you listen to as well, and he says, Beware the false prophets who come to you wearing sheep's clothing. Inwardly they are ravenous wolves. One thing I know is that Wolves in real life don't actually wear sheep's clothing. But you know what? In, in amongst humans, there are people like wolves, and they do have the capacity to put on sheep's clothing. But you know what about putting on just a sheepskin? The idea here is, and interesting, in the Greek, when it would talk about false prophets in the Old Testament, the thing called the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation of the Old Testament, wherever it talked about false prophets in the, in the Old Testament, they used a Greek word that meant sheepskin. Isn't that interesting? Sheepskin. A great description of a false prophet, false teacher. And so what happens is, it means that on the superficial level, it means that they're able to talk shop. They know your type of language. They know the kind of things that you like. They know the way to get you to trust them and things like that. But you know what I also know about a wolf? They can't stay looking like a sheep for very long because they're hungry. They want to destroy you. And that is their ultimate goal. They want to bring you down and they want to bring you down to destruction because that's their whole thing. They want to devour you. That's the main thing that they want. But you can't see it because you're looking at the surface. You're looking at the superficial things. When it comes to spiritual things, you need to put on the whole armor of God. You need to put on the helmet of salvation and you need to get serious, very serious, and look beyond the superficial and look into the depth. And one thing I know is that a wolf wants to feed himself and not feed the sheep. So you need to ask yourself on those that surround you and also about yourself. Are you someone who desires to feed the sheep or do you desire to devour them? And that they are nothing more than an object like some kind of juicy cheeseburger by which you satisfy yourself at their misery and at their destruction. Because that's what a false prophet is. They have no desire to feed you but they do have somewhere how they want to use you to devour you completely. It says, but it shouldn't overcome you because as a Christian, you should know these things because Jesus has just taught you what the law of Christ really is. He just went through the Sermon on the Mount. He told you what righteousness is. And he's making a reference right here to the wolves in sheep clothing who are called the Pharisees at the time. And he's looking at them. He said, they look the part, they play the part, they walk around in the temple, they talk about the Torah, Aren't they the right thing? And he goes, no, they're not. You have to look deeper and compare what they are doing, how they were living, and what they were saying with the word of Jesus Christ, with the scriptures. And if that doesn't line up, you should already know. But your own desires have a bent towards false prophets because your desires are evil. That's why. That's why people are willing to listen to a lot of these guys who aren't even good false prophets on TV. They're not even very sharp. 
What are they going to do when the big false prophets come out of hiding? If they're fooled by these guys, it's going to be bad because these guys are a big joke, I think. So, but what happens here, he says, you know what, you should be able to know them. And here's how. He says, you'll know them by their fruit. No, they're not trees. But let's take a look at this. He says, you don't gather grapes from uh, thorn bushes and you don't get, get, gather uh, figs from thistles, do you? He says, so then every good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. And a good tree cannot produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Okay, so here's how we do it. You can't just look at the bark and tell what's going on. That's a surface thing, right? You can't just examine the leaves and think you're a scientist and know what kind of tree this is. Ultimately, there is no way you can be fooled because I'm not very good at looking at trees to find out what they are. But I guarantee you, if I look up and I pull an orange off of a tree, I don't have to be an expert. I don't have to be a botanist to find out what kind of tree that was, right? What's going to happen is you don't have to be super deep. You don't have to be super intellectual to know what's right, to know what's wrong. You have to just know what's righteous. And if you know the Word of God and you simply look at it and you know you are supposed to do to others as you want them to do to you, and you know that righteousness is how it should be and you should not be a hypocrite and all these different things, it becomes very easy. You simply look up and you see what is being produced. And that's it. Now the primary thing here is what kind of fruit are you producing though? Because he says it more broadly here. You are supposed to avoid these types of things. He says every tree, not just the prophets who come to you, not just your teachers, but he says every tree. So that's a reference to everybody. He says, every tree that does not produce good fruit, it doesn't say they're forgiven, does it? Every tree that does not produce good fruit, the grace of God will be upon them and they'll go straight to heaven. Is that what it says? What it says is every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I'm sorry if you don't like preaching about hell. I'm very sorry for you because you simply don't like the way that Jesus Christ preaches. I really do feel sorry for you. Particularly, we're not even in Luke, and he talks about hell all the time in Luke, in much more vivid terms. But this is pretty vivid because he's going back to, guess what, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, when the Pharisees and the very guys who Jesus is talking about came to John the Baptist, and they're trying to trip him up and ask him who he is, and they're just wanting to get him in trouble like they always do, because false prophets want to tear down the real prophets all the time. So John the Baptist says, you know what, you need to bear fruit in keeping with repentance, because the axe is already laid at the root of the tree. And the imagery there is obviously a guy who has a tree that doesn't produce fruit, he's going to chop it down. And if you don't produce the right fruit, he's going to chop you down and be thrown into the fire. And Jesus is seconding up, he's shoring up what John the Baptist had already said. And he's saying it's all about what you do. Well, you say, preacher, but you're not saved by what you're do you do. You are ex absolutely correct. But you know what? I know if I am saved by examining my own works. Like I always say, I can't judge you, but I recommend that you seriously judge yourself. And we look at the works of sin in the scriptures. The works of sin is things like lust, anger, all these different things, sexual sin, pride, all these different things. Trying to tear people down with your tongue. It says that the tongue is on fire of hell. We rarely really look at whether or not we really do treat people the way that we want to be treated. I mean, one day I was hearing someone saying, they're going off on a, on a huge rage about racism. And the whole time I'm sitting there going, I know personally that the way they met their husband was by stealing him from another woman. So they were waxing strong about one sin, not waxing strong about their own sin. And that's what we all do. It's not just this person. We all do this. It is very hard to be confronted with your own sin. We simply don't like it. And it's actually halfway entertaining to talk about other people's, right? Right? But that's sad. Somehow it's not very entertaining to look at your own, though. You must be someone who looks at your own fruit as well. And then, when your eye is clear and the beam is out of your eye, you can see clearly to see what is going on around you. But if you haven't dealt with your own heart, you will have a propensity to follow false prophets. 
because you're not really wanting what is right because you haven't shown it in your own life. And so if somebody comes to you and starts preaching to you another doctrine and they live according to that other doctrine and it is somehow letting you know, you know what? You can sin. Sin is never acceptable to God in any way, shape, or form. Sin is forgivable by God, but it is not acceptable. And it cost His Son His life upon the cross. And until we take this very seriously, this church, this nation, your own life is going nowhere spiritually. And you wonder why it seems like God's so far away. Well, it goes ahead and it says that they will be thrown to destruction. And it says, but you know what? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does, he who does, do you hear that? He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter in. Doing, doing, doing. Your faith must produce works. It must produce works. And it says, you know what? On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out devils in your name? And in your name do many miracles. And he said, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity, you who are lawless. So the thing is there, he says right there that he will be the one who passes judgment on that day and people will be coming to him. Now this has got to be shocking to the Jews that this man standing before them is saying that he is the one who will pass judgment. What's he saying about himself? He's saying that he is the judge that was prophesied in the scriptures who's divine, who sits in the judgment seat. He is the one. And they will come to him and even they will acknowledge. They will say, Lord, Lord. And they will point at all this different religious activity Maybe we won't be saying, I prophesied. I don't know about you, but I haven't been prophesying lately. I don't know about you. It's been a long time since I've cast out a demon. And it's been a while since I've done a lot of miracles. But you know what? There's all kinds of other religious activity I do that I know ultimately doesn't really count anything towards eternity. Lord, Lord, did I not go to church? I was right down there at Cross Point where that nice guy Kelly Green was preaching. No, no, that doesn't count for anything. Lord, Lord, I had the shiniest shoes in the church. It won't count for anything. I was involved in this activity. I did this. I gave to the poor. All these different things, utterly meaningless on the day of judgment. What will really happen is, did you do the will of the Father in heaven? Has been revealed in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount as we've been going over all these weeks. Did you do it? Did you do it? And he'll say, basically, I would have known you. I would have known you by your fruit. I would have known that. And now he brings it to the close. He's been going on all these chapters from chapter 5, now he's in 7, and he's about to bring it home. And he wants you to hear this most of all. And he wants this to ring in your ears all through eternity, that you may know that you heard the truth. And he said, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rains fell and the floods came. That's very contemporary to us right now. The floods came. And it says that the wind blew and it slammed against the house and it said, yet the house did not fall. Why? It did not not go through floods. It didn't avoid rain. It didn't avoid all of these things that shake it and try to find out what the strength of it really is. God did not keep away these things. Matter of fact, He is the God of the storm and He sends the things that try you to see what you really are. Did you know in the Old Testament there's a passage that says that God sent the false prophets to Israel to test them? Not that he promotes false prophets, but he knew that there was something already in the heart of Israel that would be given towards false prophets. And he wanted to see what their fruit really was. But they always had the choice to resist. But many of them didn't. And he says, you need to act upon it. And this type of action means doing exactly what he says. Are you living a life of doing Christianity? Many people will say to you, you know what, I'm Christian. It's very different to say to them, are you living for the Lord? That's it. Just try that simple sentence. That reveals more than all kinds of fancy stuff you could say. And then he turns around and he says, you know what? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and sand is not stable, and it's shifting. And there's only one thing stable in this world, and it is the rock of Jesus Christ and his salvation that's handed to you because he died on the cross in your place substitutionarily so that you may be able to stand in that wicked day, and you might be able to stand in the judgment. 
and it says that the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it slammed against the house and it fell and great was its fall. Great was its fall. Not a little bit of a fall. The fall was utter. It meant that it was utterly smashed and it would never be rebuilt ever again. You will go through storms in your life that are going to shake you on the very core of who you are. There'll be things that will come that will find out what you're really made of. And if you are a doer of the word, you will stand. You simply will. Why? Because God will make you stand. God will make you stand. But if you simply want something else, you will have something else. And at the end of this, what they said was that the people, after they heard these words, that they were amazed with his teaching. Why? Because he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. I've heard this teach, uh, this taught about <clears throat> every wrong way possible. <laughs> this is what it means. Him teaching as one having authority is not as the scribes because the scribes were always referencing back to something. They would say, Will, we think that this is the way it is because we've been studying these books over here and these great scholars said that this is the way it is. Lots of ministers do this way. I'll hear a sermon from a guy and I know he's preaching more from his theology textbook in his library than he is from the scriptures. Sometimes he might get it on the head and sometimes he doesn't. But I can feel it whenever I hear a minister preaching that they're preaching from their theology book and they're using scriptures to support it. It should be the other way around. But they would teach and go, well, this is what we think. This is what and, you know, these guys here and these great rabbis. And they kept putting the authority back somewhere else. And it goes on today. People put the authority and say, well, the Pope says and the church says, or my preacher says, or my favorite author says, or the last seminar I was at says. None of that means anything. Jesus Christ said that I am the one. I am the one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And they were shocked because here was this peasant Jewish man who comes from the backwoods. He doesn't come from the city. This is the guy who would have came from, where was I at the other day? This guy would have been from Drumright. He wouldn't have been from Oklahoma City. And they can't believe that this uneducated guy from the sticks comes in and it says that it sounds like he's talking like he's God. Like he has the ability to say my words. Did you catch that? He didn't say Moses' words. He didn't say Elijah's words. He didn't say Nehemiah's words. Right there he says, the rock by which you will stand eternally is my words. And that would shake the Jewish mind. No prophet would say that. No prophet would say that. Unless it was the prophet. The prophet of God, who is God. God in the flesh. As the, as the old creed says, God of very God. And we think so lightly of him. But it is not like anyone else. And so that is the Sermon on the Mount right there. Let's all stand.